First of all, I want to tell you why this is important. I mean, I think this is really, really important. I think in 50 years, if there are any historians left, if any of us are left in 50 years, if you look back on these first couple of decades of the 21st century, it will be characterised by the way we faced a really important issue. Now, I don't know how many... Is anybody here working in, in, in an addiction clinic? OK, so if you work in an addiction clinic... Now, if you think heroin is addictive, then try oil. That's really addictive. And, you know, one of the, one of the great things that Francis did first, you know, when, when we started building this business was understanding what does that mean in terms of an addiction. We are completely addicted. Not us individually, but we are of a system that is completely addicted. Everything you see in front of you, around you, is focused on oil. Okay, oil was only discovered about in the ground about, you know, 200 years ago. And it's been wonderful. It's great. It's brought wonderful wealth to about half the world. Therein lies the other great problem we have. If a Martian were looking down, they would look down on us and say, this is really weird. They've got these little handheld devices. You can phone any other handheld device in the world. This is clearly a global village. This, they clearly have systems of talking to each other. But how is it that half of the, how is it that of these seven billion people, one billion of them are dying too early because they eat too much, and one billion are dying too early because they eat too little? That is really weird. That's what they're going to think. And what else are they going to think? They're going to think, oh, I know why. I know why they are so wealthy, this half that are dying because they overconsume. It's because they've discovered this black, sticky stuff. Well, I'll tell you, they'll tell themselves, they'll tell themselves, actually, when they realise, when they realise that unlocking this much buried sunshine is going to fry them big time, they will really get on the game and do something about it. So then they land and they open a copy of The Guardian and they think, my God, they do understand exactly what they're doing. And they're doing tiddly squat about it. That is the weirdest thing of all, okay? That we know so much and we do so little. Don't you think that's strange? I mean, I think, and we're all part of it. It's not them. It's us. It's we. It's you. It's me. We're part of this system. And that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Selfishly, it makes me very uncomfortable. I'm part of a system which is going into the sand big time. Knowingly. We do this knowingly. So it's not just the climate that's behaving oddly. The climate is behaving oddly. Let me tell you, there is one climate scenario between now and 2045, and it does not look good. There's one climate scenario. And on that climate scenario, there is not one horizontal line. OK? Our climate, our weather, everything that sustains us, everything that makes life worth living, is pretty much fixed between now and 2045. But what we do between now and 2045, what we do today, tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade, that will really dictate what happens after that, OK? So we have to do two things. We have to adapt to a very changing situation. And we have to stop that situation going out of control. So adapting is about managing the unavoidable. Mitigating is about avoiding the unmanageable. OK, and remember it and remember what time scales we're talking about. Because if there's any historians that are left, they're going to look back on us and think, what is this weird thing they have? And I, I cannot believe that an intelligent audience like you has not talked about denialism, mass denialism. Have you talked about that today? Yeah. Yeah, of course you have. And that's why that's one of the really weird things about human beings. It's one of the things that got us out of our trees. It get, got us out of the trees. It really is. What made us a frontier species, what has got us to where we are today, <laughs> is exactly what we don't need to get us any further. It's quite the opposite. And that's a real transition. Now, why is this important now, today, in this room, with you, with me? So the first thing is, we have a problem. But we have solutions. There is no problem with doing the future. We actually, we know how to do the future. It's actually quite simple. If I said to you, or you said to me, can we provide carbon-free electricity for the whole world in 2050? Yep, no problem. We know how to do it. The plans are there. The European Union have done it. The German government have funded it. It's all there. We know how to do it. 
why are we not doing this? You know, it's fairly simple. You know, we have seven deserts around the world, two of which are always facing the sun at any one time. We know how to move vast amounts of electricity around the world. We know it'll take money out of rich countries into poor countries. We know it'll provide shade. We know it'll desalinate water. We know it'll make crops go in deserts. We know how to do these things. This is not a failure of technology. It's a failure of human and political will. It's a failure of us to act and act together. That is the issue. It's that together word. One of the things we are not great at doing is the together word. Mm -hmm. This is not them. It's us. It's now. It's here. Anyway, so why is it important in this room? Well, one of the things is I think health professionals are really important. Because when health professionals don't do anything, it sends a terrible message out there. And one of the things that Sue Atkinson was saying earlier is that there is a group of health professionals, the Climate Health Council, which are trying very hard to mobilize health professionals to do something, to say something. It doesn't mean we have all the answers, but I think one of the things we can do is to stand up and say, I'm worried. I'm worried for myself, I'm worried for my patients, I'm worried for my family, I'm worried for my children, and I'm not sure I know what to do. Just do that if you make any pledge to yourself today. Just do that, because what will that do? That will engage people humbly and positively. That's what we need to do. So it's really important that health professionals, and we, don't, we know that because doctors don't smoke now, and, and doctors not smoking is very, very important. We all have bizarre habits, and I do not want to know what your bizarre habits are, but we are very clever at justifying those bizarre habits. We know that, because if you're a smoker, and you, cat, you see a nurse smoking or a doctor smoking, you say, oh, see, it can't be that, work, can't be that bad. You know, we are wonderful post hoc rationalizers. We are so clever and creative at doing that. So the reverse of that is when you see and when you hear health professionals saying, do you know what? We're living a completely unsustainable lifestyle. This is just not right. It's not right for me. And it's certainly not fair for the future. It is not fair for generations which have no voice and no choice. Okay? The, the population of the planet will be slightly bigger in 2050. It'll probably be about 10 billion. Now, how are we going to live our lives so that 10 billionth child feels really welcome? Okay? Do you think they will feel really welcome? Because I don't think we're living in ways that is going to make that child feel very welcome. So, it's important. It's important for health professionals. And why is it important for health professionals working with mentally ill people, in mental health care trusts? Why is it important? Well, I don't know the answer. You probably know the answer better than I do. But I'll, I'll proffer you some suggestions. One of the things in my job is I have to look at hospitals and try and embed in hospitals, these are big buildings that use a lot of energy, big buildings, and organisations. I have to try and help them come to terms with the fact they're going to have to run their businesses in quite radically different ways. Now, the one group of host trusts in this country that are quite good at that, much disproportionately better, are mental health care trusts. Okay? There are some outstanding examples of mental health care trusts which are really... They haven't cracked it, but they understand that business, is, as usual, is un completely unsustainable. Um, South Essex, SLAM, there are lots of, lots of them. They do really good things. Now, not everybody in those organizations knows that some revolutionary things going on, but they are. There are little signs of the future. So these little beacons, and what Rex and his team presented was a little beacon. It's a little star of the future. Okay? Now, that has got to be normed big time quickly. But I tell, you, I tell you, we have a lot of stars out there, but it's still stars in a night sky. It is still very dark out there. We are absolutely nowhere near dawn. Nowhere near dawn. You can have lots of stars in the night sky, but what we don't do, and we're very good at this in the health service, we're very good at not industrializing at scale, at pace, the very best. We give it a prize. We give it an award. We put it on a stage. We think, this is fantastic. And we all go home and do exactly the same thing. Okay, the Nobel Prizes in the future for those people who can industrialize best practice really, really quickly. So if McDonald's finds a way of frying a French fry better, faster, cheaper, you can guarantee it be in every McDonald's in the world within 72 hours. Does that feel like the NHS to you? Uh, it doesn't quite feel like the NHS. And paradoxically, it would be weird if we were learning lessons from McDonald's. So. 
I think there is something really strange here, and I think there are reasons why mental health care professionals have got a very special place in this. I mean, I don't quite know. Is, is your president here, Simon, here? Okay, I don't know what Simon said this morning, but you know, you do have a very special role, but you need to articulate that very well and very specifically and get your board, your exec team, your president, everybody on, on board with it. So the work that was done in that corner on a consensus statement is incredibly important. Say what you feel, say what you think, say what you need, need to be done. And if you're worried that it might not go down well, even better even better because at least you'll get some media attention and you've got a president which is who's quite capable of handling media attention but you have to get them on the side so what is the second reason well you've had some outstanding leadership and still have in this college i mean you've got dan you've got sue bailey you've got phil so you need to use that as an example of how this college is much more forward thinking than many other colleges. Come on, be, be, be honest, these are competitive organizations. So you need to push the boundaries. If you wait for, to say, oh, well, I'm not sure this is the quite role of the Royal College, oh, I don't know if the other Royal Colleges are, don't do that. Just get out there and say, we suggest this. We might be wrong, but this is what we think needs to be done on the basis of the data, on the basis of the success of, you know, and that's why the evaluating what you saw in the, in the, in the sort of Berkshire, therapeutic community is really important because you've got to put something that yesterday looked quite wacky into the minds of commissioners. You've got to make this sort of thing normal. You've got to say, you've got to have them say, hey, this is a really good thing to get people commissioning on the basis of outcomes, not on the basis of activity. That is really, really important. Better mental health. That's what we commission for. So one of my dreams is to see the Secretary of State for Health stand up in Parliament and say, Great success, we've done fewer operations in the NHS. Because if you say great success, we've done more operations, what sort of, sort of more, more, more culture are you fueling? You know, and, and the whole issue of, and you know very well the evidence that when we get disasters, when we get climate change, as many parts of the world are now getting, who will suffer first? Who will suffer disproportionately? Who will suffer in a marginalized way? Easy. Those people who have mental health issues. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's already happening. So you have a special responsibility and a special opportunity and indeed a special duty to speak out, not knowingly, not arrogantly, not preaching like I'm doing now. Don't, for goodness sake, do what I'm doing. But engaging people by saying, I think we should be doing things. I, I'm worried. I am personally worried. What should we be? Just engage people. That's the most powerful thing you can do. Engage people humbly. Okay? It doesn't matter if people think. You'd be amazed. And the number of times I speak to you know, important cheeses and they say, oh, in my role as the chief exec office or as the president of that, I say, gosh, that, you know, I can understand why you say that. Now, tell me what you think personally. And you get a completely different story. Tell me what you really want. What do you really wish to see on your watch? On your watch as a citizen, not on your watch as a president. What do you they say? Well, what we'd like to do in a hospital is we'd like to have all the psychiatry done, the community, we'd like to uh, close these buildings, we'd like to do a whole lot of prevention. I said, You're a leader. Why don't you try and make these things happen? Because everything is going for you. Not just environmental sustainability, but financial sustainability, and what Rex was talking about earlier, which is social sustainability as well. That's a very powerful trio of things to wish for. So how good could that be? So don't go out there and preach doom and gloom, okay? Martin Luther King did not say, I have a nightmare, okay? <laughs> you have to be very positive, but you probably have to do, we probably have to do both. As we were saying, as a colleague was saying in that group over there, we have to alert and alarm, <laughs> but we have to give rescue very quickly too. This is a serious problem, but we have an answer. We have a solution. Well, we think we do, but it involves us doing things together. So, the one really big thing I think people like yourselves can offer in terms of research and real understanding, we don't need that much more research, actually. If we do need anything, it's implementing what we already know. If we implemented what we already knew at scale and pace in every part of civic society, that would be the most innovative thing we've ever done. Okay? But actually, health professionals and health systems are not really very good at implementing what we, what we already know. Look at scurvy. Look at all sorts of things. Look at... 
Look at clot-busting drugs. We're terrible at doing it. We are so slow. We are so cautious. Um, and we have all the systems we now need to do it. So I, I, I'd really like to stop now because um, I really want to hear your questions. I'd like to hear your challenges. I want, to, I want to hear what you really feel you're up to personally, as a professional, as a citizen, as a parent, whatever you are. As a member of this college, actually, I want to feel what you're... So, so should, we, should we have some questions? Would that be okay? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Isabel Braithwaite. I'm a medical student at UCL. Um, I do different um, things with various climate and health organisations, um, including a bit with the Climate and Health Council, which has been mentioned. And something which some of you in the room may have heard about is the fact that the British Medical Association, um, the representative members, voted to end their investments in fossil fuels. The reason I mention that, although it's sort of somewhat far removed from mental health specifically, is that it very much relates to the addiction to oil that um, David Pension was talking about and the sort of parallel with, with tobacco as a massive public health issue and the role of medics in responding to that. The BMA themselves have been a bit reticent in sort of saying, yes, we're going to do this because I think they want to be quite cautious about the financial implications that might have on things. So they're sort of looking at it even though the vote was in favour. Um, but I think it is a really powerful statement. The Rockefeller Foundation committed to moving very, very large sums of money out of fossil fuels um, just last week before the climate summit. And I think that, you know, there's a real opportunity for Royal Colleges to follow suit. I know that they don't have huge amounts of money, so it is kind of, it's very much doing the right thing rather than because we have enough money to sort of make the whole difference. But if it's something that we think investors in general should be doing as it's the right thing for health, then I think, you know, maybe the Royal College of Psychiatrists could be the first one and that might encourage the others to follow suit. Or maybe it can talk to some of the others and think about doing it sort of together. How, how could they do it at the same time? And that might also be a really good way to highlight the, sort of the importance of these issues and provide a platform to be talking to the media, to the public, to patients about why these things matter for health. Uh, the question is more about uh, regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be a sustainable regulatory framework for future? The current one is very costly. Sorry, you said the, the uh, current regulatory framework is costly. Uh, well, the uh, uh, thing is, if you look at the cost of quality, kind of, uh, you look at mental health trust uh, producing reams and reams of paperwork, you see mental health trust uh, is spending more time in producing evidence rather than looking after their patients uh, yeah. very, very well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it really doesn't look like a very sustainable system for very long. So what would be a quality framework uh, that is sustainable and uh, that produces uh, good quality patient contacts in future. Mm. I'm quite a fan of regulation, actually. I think a regulation well done is very good. Actually, it's the framework on which stable societies hold together. Okay. And the evidence I would cite in support of good bureaucracy, of good regulation, of good governance, is that I don't think it's argued at all that if you take a, a continent like Africa, the one thing, well, there are three things. Let's say there are three things. Let's take a case like Africa. Three things that will make Africa, is making Africa, a better place to live, a sustainable place to live. And don't forget, most of the lessons about how we live sustainably and won't come from the wealthy world, they come from the poorest part of the world. Because they know what resilience is. They know what living in the edges. Let me tell you those three things. One is mobile telephony. Mobile telephony has revolutionized health in Africa combined with microfinance, microfinance, especially for women, okay? Those two technologies together. It's never a technology on its own. It's a combination of technologies. But the third thing that is bringing social justice and hope to so many people in Africa is good governance. And good governance relies on good regulation. Let, so let me tell you why this country is a leader, okay, one-eyed in the land of the blind, but a leader in climate change. We have a hell of a long way to go, but we are a leader. And just like this college could be a leader, we have three acts, three statutes on the parliamentary books. One is a Civil Contingencies Act 2004, one is a Climate Change Act 2008, and one is the Social Value Act 2012. Now, I have been in situations where I've been in 
contesting to do something which both you and I would think is good, and people have argued against, and I say, there's no point having this argument. This is the law. I say, oh, okay, we will do it. Even if you take another great move in the, in the NHS, like um, equality and diversity. When equality and diversity first came along, people thought, God, why did political correctness gone bonkers? Actually, you have to do this. And now, when you do surveys, even in the NHS about equality and diversity, people will say, actually, this has brought in a much more diverse, productive, valued workforce. OK, we may need the legislation less. But legislation and bureaucracy and regulation is an incredibly important thing, but only one part of a social movement of change. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about seatbelts or climate change. And it, regulation has a different part to play in all these things. But it is incredibly important. Just because you think bureaucracy is over heavy or badly done or a waste of paper or a time waster doesn't mean you should bin it. It means you should do it better. That's that's what I would say. I may be wrong, prove me wrong, but that's what I would say. I have a gut feeling that, 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 that negating climate change is kind of of a piece with this increase in uh, conspiracy theories and a general kind of move within yeah, yeah. the West to kind of say, I'm not part of the sheep, I'm not being hoodwinked, I kind of mm. reject that, which seems to be becoming more and more common. It's almost like there's a sort of increasingly common sort of borderline personality thing yeah. happening here yeah. um, and I think that's bought I think that's a result of individualism kind of gone wild really and it's kind of I'm an individual I will not join I will, I will I'll find my own way I'll reject it and I just want to say to all doctors in the house and everyone with the medical profession that in the project that we run down in Cornwall um, by some hook or by crook, you know, doctors are in a privileged position in that people do still listen to doctors. They don't listen to journalists. They certainly don't listen to politicians. They don't listen to teachers much even now. You know, so doctors have still got this kind of role where if they're going to listen to anyone, they might just listen to a, to a, do a doctor. So the doctors have a responsibility to shout very loudly that climate change is real, and they should be doing that. And I'm, you know, I'm preaching to the converted, I know. But, but I think that needs to be promulgated within the medical professions and the colleges. Yeah. yeah. I, I, would, I think that's great. I think I would go one further, actually. Do you, does anybody know the phenomenon of telling, te of telling future truths? It's a, you know, you Cornish, you might know this. Tim Smith, who did the Eden Project, he's very fond of this story. This is about if you want to, if you want to help people change, you don't say to them, oh, I want you to understand that climate change is happening. That, get past that bit. You say to people, look, I'm really worried. I'm not sure in the face of climate change whether we should be doing A or B or A and B. What do you feel? Just jump over it. Just forget this climate change thing. This is, there's better evidence that climate change is happening now. It's caused by us and it's dangerous than there is for the vast majority of medical interventions. Get used to it. If you're used to doing what you're doing, you're comfortable with what you're doing in your consulting rooms for your patients, with your patients, be comfortable with the evidence. Move on. OK, so you're absolutely right. But we don't, you don't need to do it in a hectoring style like I do it. You can do it by saying, I'm just really worried. I'm a doctor. I'm worried about my patients. And I, I'm not quite sure I, I know what to do about it. But I am worried because you're absolutely right. We always come, doctors will always come quite at the top of polls. Uh, but don't, don't think that is going to last forever. <laughs> Weirder things have happened. <laughs> so we are dangerously believed. But use that trust and build on that trust to engage people, not to hector people, okay? Because people don't come to the GP to be told that climate change is happening. But if they ask, hey, what's this thing about climate change, Doc? Have something to say. Don't waste that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Can you recommend one simple intervention that each of us could recommend to our trust that would make a difference today, that you would like your dream rollout? Because we could take that message home. I would yeah, love to hear. Great question. You know, if people will say, what are the five things I can do as a person? What are the five things I can do as an organisation? Yeah, at a trust. Well, what you can do, and I'm sorry this is not going to please my colleague here about bureaucracy, is you can, <clears throat> well, actually, this is already almost in legislation. You can ask your trust, um, where is the, tr every trust in this country is expected to have a sustainable development management plan, okay? It's expect they are monitored, the data are fed back, they're fed back to chief execs. They compare each other and they think, oh, I've got more than you've got. Um, that's what, what boys do. Um, so uh, that's the first thing you do. You say, 
do we have a sustainable development management plan? What does it say? This is the crucial third bit. Can I help? You have to help. You cannot point fingers. He says pointing fingers. You cannot point fingers. <laughs> you should, you know, it's about us. You, you, you've got to say, you know, that's great what we've done. That's great what we've done. And I'm sure we could do more. And I will help. And OK, we're busy. But, you know, we're all busy. We're all busy. So that's the first thing you can do. There, there's lots of other things you can do. I mean, I was very taken in the earlier presentation about social value. Where can our trust, regardless of, where can we be adding social value? Where can we be being a really good employer? Where can we be being a really good buyer? Can we buy from responsible organizations? Can we put that in contracts? So you, you may have heard earlier from Dan that you know, an a eye-watering amount of the ecological footprint of the health service is through buying stuff and commissioning stuff. So talk to your contracts manager and say, do you think we could put some vanilla statements in there? Give me, let me give you an example. We reserve the right to buy preferentially from those organizations that take the future seriously. And when they come back to you and say, what the hell does that mean? You say, I have no idea. Go away and impress me. OK, so you have, because there is, the, the blueprint for the future is not laid out, but you have to raise the bar and set the ambition. OK, so just do those two things and you'll have a massive effect, massive effect. But it, it seems that in the UK, I only found out today, I have to admit, that yeah. there are statutes in place. So is there any evidence how well public bodies are doing in implementing the law, NHS included, since statutes are in place and indeed the political will yeah. has apparently been in place in the UK, if yeah. not internationally? It, it's, quite, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, I don't know the full answer to that, but it's a great question and there are some examples of that. So let me give you an example. The Climate Change Act 2008 is very, very clear on what we need to do. It's got a whole plan laid out to 2050. That's pretty ambitious, okay? So part of that is something called the adaptation reporting power, which allows the Secretary of State to request from all parts of the public and private sector, what are your adaptation plans? How are you as a trust adapting to the future? Okay, it's not necessarily used, but we have allowed it. It's permissive legislation. We have said, to DEFRA, why don't you ask us in the health sector what we should be doing? Go on, ask me, ask me. They said, right, we want you to report by April 2015. Great, thank you. So I can turn around and I can write to every chief executive in the country and say, I'm required by law to ask you. So your sustainable development management plan, what does it say about adaptation? I'm just a messenger. I'm just asking because it's the law. So that's an example of how. Another example, the Social Value Act. If you read the legislation, and I don't know if Rex or anybody else has actually quoted it, it says when you publicly commission or purchase goods or services, you are required to take into consideration the social, ecological and economic effect of what you're doing on the wider community. That is hardwired in that law. So when you go along and say that, people say, oh, I don't have time, no, I'd like to debate. I say, sorry, it's the law. You know, you may well be prosecuted for not showing evidence you have done this. So, okay, the law is only one instrument of social change, but let me tell you, it's a very powerful one. So we should use it. We should use it carefully and use it diplomatically, and we should help ch shape the next iteration of it. So the answer to your question is yes, but use it. They're, they're often permissive legislation, which is not used, so we need to use it. Just, just sum up quickly, David, and I think that was the last question, so okay. we'll move on to Phil. Yeah, well, I don't think I've got anything more to say other than, you know, we as doctors, as you've heard, have a special responsibility, so we ought to make the best of that special responsibility. The, res the data on what's happening is uncontroversial. Don't go away and waste your time about whether the climate's going to rise by three and a half or four degrees. That's for the birds. It is, if we do nothing, it is bad. Okay, so we have to change. Second message, many of the things we would do for the future give very quick benefits. Moving our bodies better. Never in human history have we moved our bodies so much around the world without moving our bodies. <clears throat> Move better. Secondly, eat better. Thirdly, make sure you and your children can breathe better. Okay? And fourthly, connect with other people, build relationships. Connect more, consume less. So that's what I'd say. And the health service, for the reasons you've heard, is a very, very powerful advocate, supporter of that movement. You know, you must have heard that phrase, you know, what happens if climate change is a hoax and we create a better world for nothing? 
<laughs> so, but it's happening now. This is not about the future. It is not about someone else. It is about here, it's now, it's you, it's me. It's happening on our watch, and it will be our legacy. 